Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us um, for what is sure to be an amazing conversation um, around Dick Johnson is Dead um, from Netflix. But before we get started, um, I just wanted to introduce myself as always. Um, my name is Cassidy Diamond. I am the Public Programs and Events Manager here at the International Documentary Association. I am coming to you on um, Tongva and Chumash land, otherwise known as Los Angeles. Um, these are the unceded lands of the Tongva and Chumash people who have been stewards of this land for generations. And also before we get started, uh, I'd like to thank our media sponsor, IndieWire, as always, and, uh, or, and we have support from uh, KCRW as well. Apologies, it's a little early here. Um, and if you want to see any other um, screenings by the International Documentary Association as part of our fall screening series, um, you can go to documentary.org slash screening series. You can also join us for more conversations like this um, that are open to the public. So please check it out um, and let's get started. Uh, let me bring in here Eric Cohn from IndieWire, who's going to be our intrepid moderator for this conversation. Hi, Eric. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Also, as you can tell from my background, I love this movie so much that I decided to just live in it for this conversation. So it should be I love it. I love it. We'll take it away. Thanks for having me. I, uh, I, I'm a big fan of this movie. I, I had the great privilege of seeing it back at the Sundance Film Festival and it gave me an opportunity to spend the rest of the year thinking about it before I had the chance to revisit it for its Netflix release. And one of the things I think is really significant about Dick Johnson is Dead is that filmmakers have been struggling with whether or not to put themselves into their movies since the medium was invented, especially documentary filmmakers. But this film is unthinkable without uh, the personality and the story of the filmmaker as a part of it. And the grace and elegance and also the surprise and the wit involved in doing that is is what makes it such great cinema. So we're going to talk about some of the challenges that were involved in, in pulling this off, the personal story behind it, and uh, some of the other aspects of, of, of the filmmaking process that I'm sure many people are curious to know about after, after watching this film. So uh, please join me in welcoming the director of Dick Johnson is Dead, Kirsten Johnson, who is here with us today. Hi. Hi, Eric, and I gotta say, hi, Andrea. I This is like my most exciting Zoom ever, Eric, because instead of looking at my self-talk, I can look at Andrea making language visual, because mm -hmm. like I'm usually moving my own hands when I talk, and this is, this is like the most exciting Zoom ever. So besides being thrilled to talk to you and being invited by ADA to present the film, and I'm also living in the Dick Johnson reality, my Dick Johnson here is only Dick on a stick. He's he's a thin cardboard cutout. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, as we know, there are many versions of Dick Johnson after sitting through this movie, so it's only appropriate. Um, so uh, there, there's so much that, that I want to ask you about this movie, but I think probably the starting point for it is that it's absolutely nothing like your first film, Camera Person, uh, which is a wonderful movie that builds on your experience as as a documentary cinematographer. But to watch a film like Dick Johnson, which is you know, highly stylized, very, very much a, a personal kind of filmmaking in a different kind of way than Camera Person was, is to feel like almost like a, a second debut in a way. And I was hoping you could start us off by talking a bit about, you know, coming out of Camera Person as be, making your first feature that way, uh, approaching the, the possibility of Dick Johnson is dead and how you, how you landed on such an ambitious approach that was so different from what you'd already done as a filmmaker. Uh, thanks for that. I mean, I would say, you know me, Eric, I'm, I'm sort of, I like, I'm a maximalist. I like, and, but, yes, and again. And so it's fascinating to me that you would say it's nothing like camera person. Um, it is wildly different in that I think camera person only has one laugh in it. So I, I'm really happy to have made a film with a few more laughs. Um, but honestly, the things that are the two movies have in common are that I made camera person out of a deep need. And I certainly made this film out of a deep need. 
And um, camera person, when it came together, was deeply unfamiliar to me, which I would say is true of this film also. Um, as much as it's my life, my dad, uh, his dementia has rendered the world unfamiliar to me and has changed the nature of our relationship. What camera person did for me was sort of freed me because it was an experiment. We were deeply unsure whether it uh, would be understood, but we knew that we had done all that we could do. So the fact that it was received with so much love sort of gave me this new space to say, I want to try and push cinema in ways that I never have before. And it's okay. It's okay if this is a total wipeout because the, the desire in this film is to keep my father alive forever. And like, I know I'm going to fail at that on one level. So failing at this movie felt like, all right, let's like, let's, let's go as far into that as we can. So let's talk a bit about the initial conversations that you had with your father. I mean, watching the movie on some level feels like you're learning about how it happened, but what was the initial kind of starting point in, in real life to the extent that that exists uh, for you to, to, to sort of engage with your father? Did, was it really coming from him or, or how, did, how did you sort of initiate that conversation? You know, it's so interesting because what the, what films do for me, what camera person is doing for me, and this film is doing for me, is that it sort of creates new conversations. So yesterday I was talking to Pat Thompson of American Cinematographer, and she said, you know, in 2016, you told me you were desperate to make a film with someone funny. And I said, did I say it was going to be my dad? And she said, no, you just, you, you, you were desperate for humor uh, at that moment. And so I like tracing back all the different origin stories, but certainly um, the initial conversation with my dad came out of this dream, um, you know, that I had in which I, a man who was not my father sat up out of a casket and said, I'm Dick Johnson and I'm not dead yet. And dad and I love to talk about dreams in the same way that we love to talk about cinema. And he said something to me like, why do you think it wasn't me? Uh, you know, in some ways, it's like, why didn't you recognize me as the me that's changing? But he, his initial response was to laugh. Um, and, you know, this is the man who introduced me to Charles Adams comics, who snuck me into Mel Brooks' Young Frankenstein, who loved Monty Python, like fell off of his chair, describing how he'd fallen off of his movie theater seat at the moment of the little mint where the man explodes. You know, like, he likes it when movies make you laugh. And those are, some of those are, are some dark reference points. I mean, uh, Charles Adams totally makes sense as sort of a precedent for a film like this. And the thing that's fascinating about it is that, you know, we go on such a journey watching this thing. You were shooting it for years. So how did you sort of start to formulate the kind of tone you were going for, given that there, there's so much material and so many different layers to this narrative? You're so spot on with the word tone. This was our worry <laughs> throughout the movie. <laughs> like, what, what, what is the tone of this? Um, and that's why we uh, made some really unconventional but deliberate choices in our process. One of which was to mix three different times. So to go to Skywalker, work with Pete Horner at the beginning, middle, and end of the movie, and to do work that we undid um, in, in a quest for understanding tone. So we worked with Pete really early on to say like, if dad falls on the sidewalk, does his head go thunk and it's like a funny thunk or it's like, oh, I feel ill. That's like, he's for sure dead with that thunk or is it a roadrunner thunk, you know? So we played with tone on um, a sound level, knowing that it would take us into this new place, you know, so like the sound of Ray's horn, for example, as he, you know, sort of blows the horn at the funeral, there were so many versions of the tone of that. And that's what sort of freed us up to imagine this, this place where we could be in the movie between what has happened and what will happen. So, that was the process as an idea was that, okay, there are things happening. There is 
the relationship with my father that is unending and that I, I will say I, from what I know of my relationship with my mother who died in 2007, our relationships do not end when people die. So there is the, there is the unending parts of this movie and then there are, you know, the constantly changing present and, and what happens in the sort of unexpected moment of the constantly changing present, we often um, happen to film when we're filming documentaries. And even though we can't count on what it's gonna be, we know it's gonna be juicy. So if I'm filming in my father's office when he's moving out, if I'm filming in our family house when we're moving out, I know we're going to feel something. I don't know what it is. So one track of the film is following that. The next track of the film is how do we imagine the unimaginable in those documentary scenes and spaces. So we would film something, edit it, play around with the sound design of it, and then imagine how we could inject the unimaginable into it. And then so we were doing that with scenes and then we were doing that with the overall structure of the film. And you know, we sort of had this mantra of let's keep dropping a bowling ball on the roof of this movie. So that sort of every time like we had a structure, it was functioning, then we would break it again in the way that death breaks us again, in the way that dementia breaks us again. Hmm. Well, let's back up and talk a bit more about those death scenes because they're so integral to the kind of unique nature of this movie. And we see so many different versions. I mean, there there's a sort of the at-home death, the street death, and then there are these, you know, dreamlike sequences on, 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 uh, on a set. So what was the process like in terms of brainstorming coming up with different ways that your father could bite the bullet and then kind of, you know, crossing things off that might seem too ambitious or, or, you know, breaking them down in terms of, you know, what made the most sense for what you were trying to get across? Well, you can imagine these are very different conversations to have with your father, with your brother, with your six-year-old children, you know, so we had so many conversations about what the deaths could be. And my dad was like, I wanna be shot by a jealous husband. You know, we, we, we were constantly coming up with new ideas, but the fact was in between the time when we shot the funeral and Netflix jumped on board with us, sort of took this like colossal risk with us, thanks to the faith that Lisa Nishimura had in the project. And I think she also kind of fell for dad. Um, mm. By the time that happened, dad's dementia had advanced. So I honestly, we had big plans. Like we were going to Ghana, to Paul Willie's six feet deep shop. We were going, you know, to put him on an ice floe in the Arctic. I wanted to go to Hong Kong with him. I had, I had done research with um, a stunt coordinator in Hong Kong who had lost both of his legs in a car accident. You know, I was like far along a journey that was going to take me and dad out into the world together and by the time we had the budget to do it, I realized dad's dementia and his physical condition wasn't going to allow that. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of classic cinema, you know, like you like welcome to your constraint. You have finally have money. Now your lead, your lead protagonist can't do anything, you know? So it, it, it was, and, but I, that's what we knew. We knew it would not be the way we imagined it. We, that was the, that's the point I'm making about life and death here, right? Like, Eric, like, you've imagined this interview one way, yeah. but you didn't imagine me saying to you right now, Eric, how do you wish to die? Have you thought about it? I'm asking you, Eric, in this moment. Right. How do you and die, then, Eric? Right. And, and I, haven't, I haven't had that question posed to me before, so... It right. puts me in a completely unusual headspace. <laughs> and it's a little, it's like a little bit not okay, right? It's a little transgressive right. Right. to our relationship as journalist right. and subject. Yeah. Um, so what comes to mind? In, in my particular situation, yeah, you, somewhere in a bed, comfortable, fading nice. out with some nice music playing. Nice. Do you know what music you want it to be? I was, you know, smooth jazz, probably. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Lots of people want to die in their sleep, but no, I haven't heard anyone say they... Oh, that just seems boring. You don't right. even know it's, what's coming. Right. Um, and now I'm going to ask Andrea. Andrea, do you know, have you ever thought about how you wish to die? 
She's never yeah, thought about yeah. it. Are you yeah. an if you dyer? Um, have I thought about how I wish to die? No. Yeah. Um, I probably have thought about how I not want to die. The things you don't want to happen, you know, right. you family and children and stuff. I don't want to shock like that for my family, but you know. I like, I like the way that, that we imagine that your death won't be a shock for your family. It will be, right? That's the deep thing about this. Like when I was making this movie, I said to myself, you know, I literally said out loud, if I die. <laughs> and someone laughed at me. And like you're saying, Andrea, you're saying, I don't want it to be a shock for my family and children. The truth is like, it's gonna be a shock for me when he dies, even though I've spent the last three and a half years only thinking on how I might kill him, right? Mm -hmm. And Eric, like, you're the same as me. You're like, when I die, if I die, like, I better, like, it's like a, it's a shock to ask ourselves that question. It's right. a shock to fill in that blank of that sentence. Blank is right. dead. Right. Well, and, and part and of that also that's part of the tone of this is to like go through the screen, go through the screen to Andrea, go through the screen to you, and engage in a back and forth. Well, that's uh, one of the things I think is really interesting is we see that in the movie too. A lot of times, I mean, that the you're you're kind of struggling through this process sometimes in terms of what you choose to show us, but also sometimes in a more organic fashion, it, just engaging with your father. Sometimes you get emotional and so forth and. I think few people would know more about the challenges documentary, documentarians face in terms of, you know, when to reveal themselves on camera, how much to reveal, you know, am I doing more of a performance when I know the camera is there and so forth. So having been there on the sidelines to some extent, what did you sort of think about when you realized that this was going to be part of the challenge? Oh, yeah. I mean, because, you know, the footage in camera person is unself-aware. Right, there maybe were a few scenes that I shot after I started making the film, but more or less everything that's in the movie, I didn't ever think I would be exposed as having that footage, you know, relate to me. In this case, like right from the beginning, I was like, oh, everyone will know I'm a camera person when I move the camera. Like, are they thinking about what I'm thinking when I'm moving the camera? Like, mm -hmm. I became hyper self aware. Um, but I think there's like a, a, you get used to it. I mean, it's like, Andrea, you didn't expect me to come through the screen and ask you to speak in words, right? She was sort of comfortably speaking with her hands and then all of a sudden I asked for her to speak. And this is the process for me behind the camera, sort of realizing I've revealed that I am speaking by filming. And now that colors everything I film, like moving forward, everything I film I'm, I'm suddenly present. So then, you know, we sort of got into interesting discussions of then how can we play with that, right? Knowing that the audience is as sophisticated as we all are. Like, we're no fools. <laughs> like, we know people die. And we know people die in horrible ways. We know what this world is. And yet, we all wish not to know. Andrea wishes her family would not be shocked by her death, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Eric, you wish that you don't have to think about it for a really long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, 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 that's our wish space. And I think in some ways as uh, filmmakers or cinematographers, we wish to not be revealed and we also wish to be revealed, right? So it's kind of a push pull and it's also like, we all wanna look good, right? And so, you know, what camera person revealed to me is that like in attempting to look good, sometimes you're revealing your worst self and letting go and, and saying like, actually, maybe now Andrea goes home and has a conversation with her family about mm -hmm. death. Mm -hmm. Maybe I have a conversation with my children about my father's death and his dementia, that suddenly in that letting go, we allow our humanity. And so with the film, it was a process for me where, you know, I had to let go of the camera sometimes, let other people film on my behalf, let people film me while I was filming. Um, and eventually it became like, oh, I have to speak 
too, you know, because I wanted to do this film without voiceover, of course, because right. that had worked in camera person. But then at a certain point, someone said, like, you throw your dad under the bus all the time and you don't throw yourself under the bus. Yeah. Um, so, so it's like, and these, this gave new ideas as we stripped these things back. It was like, reveal more, reveal more. So the action of doing it gives me more ideas. So for example, I resisted doing the voiceover, but I was like, oh, okay. So then, you know, there's no place in my crowded house to do it. So then I went into the closet and I'm getting really earnest into my cell phone and then my dad just opens the closet and says what are you doing in there <laughs> and then suddenly we have this idea right yeah oh this is what we show me in the closet recording and dad interrupting me right mm -hmm. so that the real life would give us the next step so once we killed my dad a lot the producers the wonderful producers marilyn ness katie chevigny maureen ryan they were like do we have to keep killing your dad like can he go to heaven? Like, can he just have some kids? Right. You know, like, and so suddenly I was like, what is my problem? Like, why do I need to keep seeing my dad all bloody? Like, can he be like sitting there with a sheepskin, you know, sheepskin chair and a lay and Farrah Fawcett at his side? Like, why not? <laughs> right, right. And then, then it really gets into this surreal plane where anything can happen, which leads to another question I had. Um, I'm, there are some moments in the movie where you kind of have to bring us up to speed or we get a sort of a synopsis of something that happens say when he goes to the hospital or something like that um what at what moment did you decide not to pick up the camera i mean what when, when do you because i'm sure as you're you're filming this there are probably things that happened where you thought i need to capture this or i should probably bring the camera along to this visit or whatever but at, at what point in time was there a line you didn't want to cross well, I mean, I believe those lines that we don't want to cross, um, that mostly that's fear. You know, sometimes it's respect. Um, sometimes it's humility or awareness of having seen someone else cross that line and say to yourself, I'm never going to do that, right? But that idea of the line, I think is very powerful for me. And I think about it in terms of um, sort of cinema itself, right? You know, this line is there, where is the line between the three of us in this conversation? Where would you draw it? Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm just waiting for Andrea to ask a question, right? Like somehow, like, can someone step across the line? What happens if that happens? Um, and the line between life and death, you know, doctors will say there's a difference between brain death, body death, breathing death, right? The, the actual where you pass from life into death is deeply unknown because we don't know what's on the other side of death. Like, you know, no one has come back from that, except maybe Dick Johnson. Um, <laughs> but, but this idea of the ethical line, I'm always like, as I, you know, attempted to show in camera person, like, I got lucky, like I filmed those little kids with the ax, but one of them could have cut himself and I could have been filming in that moment. And that sort of negotiation, second by second negotiation of an ethical line is really at play with dementia. Because I could have sidelined my father three years ago and said, he is not completely lucid. He doesn't understand time and space. So I will not make a movie with him. Instead, he and I said together, okay, we don't know where dementia is taking us, but we're going there together. I'm not taking you out of the picture. I'm keeping you in the picture, even when you can't keep track of time. So we knew that was gonna be tricky territory. And like in the film where my dad's like, you can kill me, just run it by me before you do it, you know? Um, but this kind of question, like it becomes very complicated with, dementia because it's flipping all the time like it's okay it's not okay every minute every second and that's where i question the lines and i want to i'm 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 in the lines i'm stepping in the lines and then the edit room is a place where if we went over the line we can say we want to pull back here or we want to go further we want to lean further into it right well let's talk about the arc of the film in that respect because a lot of times documentary filmmakers have this unique sort of situation that distinguishes the form from narrative and that you have to decide what your ending is. 
you, sh- you have an event coming up or you shoot a scene or something, you're like, that's my ending, it just happened. So yeah. what was your ending originally and how did it evolve with time? What a wonderful question. Um, so my, I actually did have an original ending. I, you know, when I pitched this film, I said, uh, we're gonna kill my father over and over again with the help of stunt people until he really dies for real. Um, so death was supposed to be the end of this film. Uh, but at a certain point, you know, on the question of my father's capacity to participate in it, you know, one of the last stunts he did was lifting up that spoonful of tomato soup. And that's actually really hard for him to do that stunt. Like that becomes a stunt when you have dementia, like just asking my dad to get those alphabet letters out of the soup was hard. And so, you know, suddenly one of the things that I had learned when we filmed that funeral, um, I had the initial idea is we'll do this funeral now while dad's alive. And then when he really dies, we'll do it again. And that will be the funeral that's at the end of the movie. Um, and then we sort of realized, wait a minute, this is cinema. And we have the final funeral. Now what we have to do is create the real death. And how can we create the real death? And so that sort of became more interesting, both on the level of cinema language, but as a human, one of the reasons I wanted to do the funeral was because at my mother's funeral, she wasn't there to hug me at the end of it. And I was like, I'm not doing that again. (laughs) So this time my dad was there to hug me at the funeral. And, and I suddenly realized in the making of this film, I'm doing the same thing. I want dad to be there when this film is done. But that's also what permitted me to call it Dick Johnson is dead, mm. right? And for him to live with that title was initially just like sick. I woke up like in a cold sweat, like I can't do this to him. I can't call this movie Dick Johnson is dead. And I talked to him about it and he was like, Oh yeah, you can. It's perfect for reaction formation. I'll just live forever if you call it that. <laughs> well, and, and the other thing that I think is relevant here is that the dementia process is something that unlike, you know, the edit room, you just can't control. So he's on his own timeline that you didn't invent that you can't, you know, start or stop. And, uh, and I wanted to ask you about that because you, you were speaking before about how certain things you you might imagine going a certain way can then change all of a sudden. And with something like this, it's, you know, it's a medical condition that is so thoroughly documented. I'm sure you did a lot of reading. You probably talked to people who had been through it. What surprised you given that you, I'm sure, spent a lot of time learning about what was in store for your father's condition? Well, I mean, it's interesting. The, The school I've been to is the school of having done this before. You know, the school I went to was my mother's dementia. And um, I actually, um, I actually didn't want to know more than that. Like on a certain level, like that was too much. I already uh, knew too much for my own taste um, because, you know, it's like this decline that you like, oh, you're sort of used to it and it's so crazy, but that, ah! And then the bottom drops out of it again. And just when you're like, okay, I've wrapped my brain around the fact that my mom like thinks every shadow on the ground is a hole, then all of a sudden she's like, you know, trying to crawl into the hole, you know? And um, so I, I knew with this that I was just gonna, um, I was gonna like sort of ask for cinema's help. And that the the act of trying to make something funny with my dad, like that as our shared mission, um, meant that he would watch a scene that Nels Bangarder and I had cut and he'd sit with his caregiver Marta, watch the scene and like kind of chuckle. And I'd be like, dad, what'd you think of that? And he's like, meh. And then I'm like, all right, let's recut the scene, you know, until he watched it again and he would really laugh. So he, he was in a way like the dream, you know, the dream editor who never gets sick of the footage. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like he kept watching the footage and having it be new for him and see new things in it. 
um, which is the kind of phenomenal thing about dementia that I'm learning to accept besides the loss, besides the pain, the grief, the horror of it, it also gives people new ways of seeing things. And um, in my father's case, you know, he just has like new levels of insight into what empathy is, self-empathy is, um, that really challenged me. And so I, I was trying to let the film keep surprising me as his dementia kept surprising me. Um, so it, it was to never try to get too far in front of it, like to be behind it and then try to jump in front of it, but realize that it was ahead of me again, like that back and forth. We said the word iterative all the time, but back and forth mm -hmm. is really operative. And there was a moment in September, I think, where Nels was just like, we can't break this film again. And I was like, Nels, don't you remember? We're going to break it to the very end. Um, mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah. and then we really did. Then we really did. So where, where did this experience lead you as a filmmaker, just to bring this kind of full circle, because uh, it's, it's fascinating trying to categorize this film is, is this really uh, amazing exercise in futility, which I know is what you're going for. It's, very, it's always really gratifying when a movie sort of defies that or to think of what are the precedents for something like this. Um, but, it, but it's also an interesting question for you. I mean, you know, are you, are you sort of leaning further into this personal trajectory as a filmmaker? Where, where, do, you, where do you see yourself going from here? I love the idea of exercise in futility. Um, that's beautiful. And um, what I totally see, and you see me smiling, like I'm totally smiling about this. I am more free. I want to break cinema even more. Like I want to turn my experience with cinema into an existential like battle <laughs> and and that feels fun to me as messed up as that is that feels really fun because as we all know the world is transforming falling apart like breaking into pieces and think like hallelujah <laughs> that what cinema is it's sort of undefinableness is like popping out all over and why is that happening it's because finally like people have stormed the barricades right like cinema was a gated community um that many people did not have access to all around the world and the fact that people that everyone's a camera person now everyone's got a cell phone in their pocket like we are suddenly seeing visions of other people's subjectivity. We are seeing worlds we have never imagined. And that means like, boom, you know, we have a series like I May Destroy You, like feeling like it's coming out of nowhere, but then I went back and I watched Cabaret and Bob Fosse and it's like, oh, people have been doing this, but certain people have been doing this in their own way, from their own worlds. And as we have sort of the explosion of more worlds coming into our, visual cinema space like look at andrea being here with us transforming this space transforming this dialogue like i keep getting distracted by looking at her hands mm -hmm. right this is what's happening we're letting more people into the room the room just like is no longer a room right it's a room full of rabbit holes and doors and windows and extra rooms and that for me feels thrilling, both for the world, which desperately needs an end to like misrepresentation and easy answers, but also for me as a human and as a filmmaker, like I am more free to play more. So that's what I'm doing with my cinema. And I would, I'm hoping it will continue to be uncharacterizable, uncategorizable. Um, I want to, I want to make, like new language for myself to understand the things I don't understand about this world. So more specifically, do you know what you're doing next? Yeah, I'm, um, one of the things I'm doing next is a project called Camera People of the 21st Century. Um, so I'm sort of reaching out to all of my beloved colleagues, peers, friends around the world who are in 
different contexts than me and we are sort of talking together, we're going into each other's archives together um, and making some new work. But I, um, I think it's gonna be pretty juicy. I'm already, it's already way out of my control. I can tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> That's exciting. Well, just to bring this full circle, um, I wanted to ask you about how your father's doing, but to preface it also with an anecdote, so I saw the movie at Sundance, um, and then when I was on my way back, I was in the Salt Lake City airport, and you know, it's always funny if you've had the opportunity to travel to a film festival, when you run into, say, an actor from a movie or something like that, and you realize that everybody's kind of doing the same thing. I, I, I was sitting at the gate and I heard a voice and I was like, I know that voice from somewhere, but where? And then I realized that your father was sitting there with his caretaker, who I also knew from the movie. And they were sort of waiting for the same flight that I was going to be on. And I didn't want to interrupt because it seemed like they kind of had their own thing going on. But it was just, it was such a fascinating, surreal kind of encounter because to see your father as a real person and also, you know, clearly still going through the situation we see in the movie was like the, the film spilled out into the real world. And I know you, yes. you brought him to this festival, you, you did some Q and A's and things like that. So what was, yeah. what has that experience been like for you? And then, you know, how's he doing these days? I love that, Eric, that the world, like the, the movie spilled out into the world and the world spilled out, like, and you were posed with the ethical line, right? Yeah. Do I cross that line? Do I talk to them? Do I not talk to them? Um, you know, and my dad like often will call in the middle of an interview and I'll put him on the line with people. Um, mm -hmm. The pandemic shifted everything, right? And um, because I had been traveling um, at the time uh, when the pandemic first started, I'd been to Spain. Um, we were really concerned that I might infect him if I was ill. And so in that sort of quarantine period, my brother came and got my dad and my dad stayed with my brother from March until August, which is an incredible gift to our family because finally my brother could understand what had been going on. Um, and then in August, um, we made the decision as a family to move him into a dementia care facility and I gotta tell you, like, it literally, like, I literally ripped my heart from my body. <laughs> Such okay. a hard decision. And, um, you know, you can rationally say I'm doing this on behalf of his safety during the pandemic time. Because um, with dementia, the, there's, like, incredible difficulties around trying to manage him in a COVID environment, right? Right. And he is both... Um, completely wants to come home and, you know, misses us terribly and also completely himself. And like, I love it here. Everybody's so nice. The food's delicious, right? So yeah. it is all things. He is still alive, right? But he is, he's shifted from what he was. And what's been so beautiful is the, um, having these many Zoom conversations with people about the film, including lots of people who knew my parents. I'm sort of learning new things about who my parents were. I'm taking that information back to my dad. And then like new stuff is coming out. So it's like this sort of like, it's like excavation tools or archeology span or something. Like the film is very much alive and giving me ways into my dad that like, dad's pulling away but then the film keeps like bringing me back in so that thing is is just helping me and i think helping him in this time um and i did visit him recently and i had to stay six feet apart but i brought the camera because i could see into his eyes i could mm. use the telephoto to like get closer to him which reminded me of like the ways that we can get closer even as we are separated so you mm. and i and andrea are here today like through our images through the sound of our voices and is that not cinema is that you know and the aliveness of this so whoever watches this then joins with us enters in this space with us and i think that's alive even though we're, we're all completely dead and long gone and recorded and this happened yesterday it sounds like you might have started filming the sequel you know it might be a little ps <laughs> <laughs> a short film extra 
So uh, I assume you, you, you required everyone, all the caretakers at the facility to watch this movie when your father they, went in. They watched it multiple times. Wow. And what's amazing is they have a practice there where they have a daily session. There's like about eight people who live there. They have a daily session, everyone telling each other about their lives and everyone sort of hearing it for the first time. So they ask different questions. So the facility actually um, writes and rewrites the biography of each person who stays there. And mm. so they're actually learning new information about my dad. So like they wrote this biography of my dad and I was like, oh, there were a couple things in there I didn't know. Mm. So that's what I love about, you know, an interview. You and I hopefully will have many interviews in our future. And I'm actually going to start requesting that everybody hire Andrea and that she be present <laughs> for all interviews. Me too. Right? Let's keep it's that so going. Fun. Thank you, Andrea. You're totally, it's totally a good time having you here. Um, and thank no, you, Kristen. So, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's not, we will never die, Eric. Yeah, that's always the hope as long as as long as we keep recording our conversation. So this has certainly been a memorable one, just like the movie. So thank you again for being here and best of luck to you and, and to Dick Johnson as well. Thank you so much, Eric. <laughs>